learned a little more. The screen visible? Yes, sir. So, first of all, when does it happen? The onset of postural puncture is the timing is very important. Usually, the headache and backache are the dominant system symptoms that develop after a deliberate or an accidental neural puncture. And it starts in the first 48 hours or occur within three days of the procedure. But very rarely, it may present within the 48 hours itself, immediately after neural puncture, or may develop very rarely after five days also between five and seven days of the procedure. But the common presentation is during the first 48 hours, patients start complaining of headache and uh, neck pain and the posterior part of the head. The symptoms are predominantly headache is the most presenting complaint. And uh, it is the so-called spinal headache is uh, described as a severe, dull, non-throbbing. It is not a throbbing pain. It is a non-throbbing pain, like a traction pain. Patient may say something is pulling on the head. And usually fronto-occipital is aggravated in upright position, diminished in the supine position. And it may be accompanied by nausea, vomiting, visual disturbance or auditory disturbances as uh, she described. And it's so characteristic, that is the postural nature of this headache is so characteristic, that is the main pathognomonic feature of this particular disease. And that uh, diagnosis is made only by this particular uh, unless you ask the patient when does it occur, whether it is lying down or sitting up, you will not be able to diagnose this. Now, what is the pathophysiology? It's a CS of hypotension. Actually, means it's a CS of hypotension. It generates a headache and it has been described as a bimodal mechanism involving the loss of intracranial support and cerebral vasodilatation, especially the venous channels. So that is the description of the pathophysiology, which is called bimodal mechanism, loss of intracranial support for the brain and stretching of the meninges and vasodilatation of all the venous channels. That is why it is, if it is arterial, you will have a throbbing headache. But because it is mainly a venodilatation, it is non-throbbing. And it is causes the diminished buoyant support to allow the brain to sag in the upright position resulting in traction and pressure on pain sensitive structures within the cranium like dura, cranial nerve, bridging veins and venous sinuses. These four anatomical structures are put to the stretch. So that is the reason for the pain. And there is also a theory called adenosine mediated vasodilatation, which may occur secondary to diminished intracranial CSF and reflexively secondary to traction on intracranial vessels. So, where else is this adenosine is uh, causing vasodilatation in our body? Liver, sir. Kidney. Liver, then? Coronaries. Coronaries also, whenever you have normal physiology itself, in coronary circulation, whenever there is a demand, when you exercise or you do any strenuous work, uh, and the coronary blood supply has to be increased. Adenosine is the main dilator. Okay, so that is how this adenosine helps in the majority of the situation. So this is the second pathophysiological mechanism of this uh, PDPH, and multiple neural pathways are involved. And this is the ophthalmic branch of trigeminal nerve, it causes the frontal head pain. And cranial nerves 9 and 10 cause the occipital pain, and cervical nerve C1, C3 cause the neck pain and shoulder pain. And the nausea is attributed to vagal stimulation. And auditory and vestibular symptoms are secondary to direct communication between the CNS, CSF, and the uh, uh, a breath and cochlear aqueduct, which results in the perilymphatic pressure in the inner tube and an imbalance between endolymph and perilymph. So, this is how the entire pathophysiology has to be described. 
And visual disturbances are transient palsy of the nerves supplying the extraocular muscles like cranial nerve 3, 4, and especially the cranial nerve 6, which supplies the lateral rectus muscle. Sometimes we may find patient may have a um, medial squint also. In some patients of very severe BDPH, this may also be seen. So all this involvement of the nerve structures also, you have to write in your answer of the pathophysiology. Now, what are the differential diagnosis of PDP? That also has to be included because sometimes, you know, if you have done an aseptic dural puncture without proper sterilization and all that, it could result in a meningitis, which have also happened in the first 48 hours to 72 hours. And you must be able to differentiate between a meningitic uh, headache and a post-dural puncture headache. And there are several other conditions which are which can be very serious and which can be very innocuous. So it can be classified as benign etiologies, which are non-specific headaches. Patient might have been suffering from um, some non-specific headache earlier, or migraine also may be there, or hypertensive headache, and the pneumoencephalus, especially when you use air for identifying the <clears throat> loss of resistance in the air. Uh, for identifying the epidural phase, and you make a, a, a unintended or a, unexpected puncture and uh, inject an ml of the air which you have loaded in your syringe, that can result in pneumoencephalus and produce the pain. Our patient may be already having some sinusitis which can get exaggerated, or it can be drug related, like ondansetron is the drug which can cause severe headache. Okay, so, so for non-transitron given routinely as a uh, anti-emetic, uh, one of the side effects is a headache. And spontaneous intracranial hypotension. All these things are benign causes of uh, differential diagnosis of CDAPH. But at the same time, there are some serious etiologies like meningitis, subdural hematoma, or subarachnoid hemorrhage, or pituitary apoplexia, or patients who have already a preeclampsia or eclampsia, they may also have a headache. So you should not mistake it as PDPH and ignore it. Intracranial venous thrombosis because of the venodilatation are already existing <clears throat> intracranial tumors which have been an asymptomatic during the preoperative phase. They can start showing or exhibiting in the form of a headache in this. So you can divide them as benign and serious etiologies. And cerebral malaria, very, very rare uh, differential diagnosis. Now, what are the risk factors in which of the patients in whom you have to anticipate and try to avoid this? Patient-related risk factors, you can, uh, in female sex is more common, especially pregnant women, where you do a, a cesarean routinely. There, uh, the incidence of PDP is more, and the younger the age, and vaginal delivery after a uh, labor analgesia, uh, where an inadvertent puncture has happened, where patient strains during delivery, low body mass index, and non smokers. Now, equipment and technique related risk factors. This is another point which you have to include in your answer. I think uh, you did you mention about it, Abhirami? Yes, sir. So needle size is very important. Uh, 22 gauge causes more headache than 26 gauge. So that is the reason why nowadays we go for very fine caliber uh, final needles for even for a single shot. And the design of the needle between non-cutting bevel and the cutting bevel is very important. And uh, the technique that you use, if you are uh, going to uh, get a Final in the first shot, the incidence of PDPH is much low. But if you make multiple attempts and then uh, because the CSF is not draining properly, you are forced to try two, three times, then the chances of PDPH are more. And uh, management, coming to management, how we manage first bed rest. First, uh, earlier, the most advocated is uh, complete bed rest. But uh, contrary to the earlier advice, nowadays, they found that patients should be encouraged to ambulate despite the fact that they may get the mm. headache in the end posture. Uh, the earlier advice of uh, bed rest is not uh, recommended anymore. 
then patient who develops headache should be encouraged to lie in whichever position they are comfortable so uh, don't make them lie on supine or on the lateral side or anything whichever position patient is uh, comfortable that can be encouraged earlier prone position was ad advocated because it will raise the intra abdominal pressure and try to increase the spinal csf pressure and reduce the uh, stretching of the cranial compartment structures but it is not suitable for all surgeries after doing a laparotomy you cannot ask the patient to lie prone on the tummy uh, you can do it for limb procedures and other things but uh, this is also not suitable for all patients hydration status earlier we were uh, taught as a uh, species we were taught you have to over hydrate patient doing lot of uh, iv fluids at least 20 to 30 ml per kg per hour was the uh, idea even if you allow oral in addition to oral you were asked to give seven uh, iv fluids also now that the recommendation is also not there maintain normal balance but don't over hydrate then earlier abdominal binders were also used like uh, the belt that is being given for pregnant women after delivery abdominal binders were used which are now not at all recommended coming to the analgesics you can use paracetamol nsaid drugs opioids anti emetics to control symptoms of nausea and vomiting and uh, uh, to reduce the need for an interventional therapy so most of the care patients uh, settle down with uh, this uh, minimal an analgesics and uh, caffeine was considered as the best drug earlier why why caffeine was considered as a drug of choice for post spinal headache in spite of uh, analgesic like paracetamol and vasoconstriction ah, it causes a vasoconstriction because i told you the pathophysiology is bimodal one is because of the stretching of the structures the other is the vas veno dilatation so that veno dilatation or vaso dilatation is taken care of by caffeine it is a central nervous system, system stimulant and produces cerebral vasoconstriction and that is the reason why even today people say if you have a mild headache go and have a coffee you will feel better because in a normal headache one pathology is there is a vasodilatation so if you take caffeine or coffee it causes vasoconstriction and you feel better that is the concept the idea behind that <clears throat> and the dose recommended for this is 300 to 500 mg oral or intravenous caffeine also can be given and uh, they have tried neostigmine and atropine gabapentin theophylline hydrocortisone serotonin agonists like sumatriptyl which all cause vasoconstriction methyl ergometrine all have been tried with varying degrees of success but not on a routine basis now after the conservative management you have to write about the invasive therapy for pdph and um, the gold standard as she rightly mentioned is epidural blood patch which is the most effective treatment and it is uh, how they thought about is after the bloody tap sometimes you know i don't know how many of you have experienced when you put a needle or especially when you try for a, a epidural you puncture a epidural vein and uh, you get a frank blood coming out of the needle all of you uh, would have experienced it at least once in your uh, lifetime and uh, this patients who developed a bloody tap they did not get pdph so that is how they thought an epidural blood patch could be <clears throat> the treatment for that and it was first described by american anesthesiologist turan osdil and the surgeon james b gornley around 1960 these are the two people who recommended that in case you go attend a quiz in a cme program and they ask the name you can remember this and what is the technique of epidural blood patch how do you do that you must uh, take aseptic precaution preferable to have the patient in lateral position rather than sitting position and the epidural space is located with a two hin needle at the same level where previous uh, lumbar puncture was done or one space lower than that so that is the location where you have to do that and you draw 30 ml of the patient's own blood from their arm and inject it slowly through the two hin needle so 
if you, somebody has to draw the blood and give it to the EC, so it is easy to use <coughs> two clinicians. So one to do the lumbar puncture and uh, identify the epidural space. Another person who is also washed up with a sterile glove and uh, mm. sterile syringes, he can draw the blood and hand it over to the person who is the identifying the epidural space. And the injection should be stopped if the patient complains of back pain or if you find any difficulty in injecting the drug, you should not force it and inject it into the space. At the conclusion of the procedure, patient is made to lie still for one to two hours on his back, allowed to mobilize later on. We need not put him in the prone or anything. You can allow him to lie on his back and uh, <clears throat> mobilize only after two hours. Now, what are the precautions you have to take before epidural blood patches? The patient should not have any fever, which may be a sign of infection or any infection at the site of uh, epidural attempt, coagulopathy, or patient refuses. Uh, he says, I will suffer this headache. I don't want any epidural blood patch. So if that refusal is there, these are all contraindications. In patients who have positive for HIV, who have accepted for the procedure, you can do it. Viral, uh, if they don't have any secondary bacterial or viral illnesses which are active at the time of doing it. Otherwise, uh, HIV patients can draw the blood and give it in the epidural space in uh, a patient not suffering from any acute illnesses. Now, what are the risks of uh, Epidural blood patch it carries the risk of transient paresthesia, radicular pain, and uh, you may be trying to uh, identify the epidural space and you may again produce a dural puncture instead of putting a blood patch, and epidural infection also can happen. What will be the outcome of PDPH? 90, 70 to 98% of patients get cured without any problem within 24 hours of the dural puncture. That is the success rate. And if it fails to resolve the headache, it can repeat again a second time of blood patch after three days, and which has also has a similar success rate. Now, what are the other techniques to treat the PDPH apart from this gold standard technique of epidural blood patch? Epidural fluids, <clears throat> both infusions and boluses of saline into epidural space may transiently increase the CSF pressure and provide temporary relief. The placement of an intrathecal catheter through the dural puncture hole for 24 hours. They used to put a small micro catheter, which is of 20, 29 or 30 gauge for 24 hours as a proposed as a preventive measure for PDPH. And the, <clears throat> this intervention of leaving a catheter there causes, uh, it acts like a seal, preventing the disease of leakage. And this causes an inflammatory reaction, which uh, uh, closes the hole after you remove the catheter also. So the catheter should be a very, very small size, as I told, it should be a micro catheter. Then, you know, palatine ganglion block, as she mentioned, has been uh, found to be the re recent method. And this can be a collection of parasympathetic cells located in the bilateral nas, posterior to the middle nasal concha and the nasal pharynx. It also causes a vasoconstriction by blocking the parasympathetic induced vasodilatation. So the aim is uh, out of the two uh, bimodal mechanisms of pathophysiology, one is the stretching of the structure, second is the vasodilatation. So contracting the vasodilatation by vasoconstriction is a, uh, one of the methods of contracting the PDPH. So patient is made to lie supine in the sniffing position to take a long cotton-tipped applicator, 2 to 4% lignocaine, and then insert the cotton-tipped applicator in the patient's snare, aiming straight back, advance until the posterior nasopharynx is reached and there is a resistance cell. Leave this for about 10 minutes and remove. And this is the way how it is to be done. So patient is lying down, you can see the cotton-tipped uh, catheter is going down to the middle conical area, middle nasal turbinate. Leave it there for 10 minutes where the uh, ganglion is there. 
this i have given a little more uh, in elaborate because sometimes this is given in the ascii also so i thought uh, i will give a little more details for you and uh, neuraxial morphine also has been tried 3 mg epidural morphine reduces the development of pdph and need for uh, ebp allowing accidental dural puncture a small tidbits about this there is uh, <clears throat> There's a term dura mater, which all of you are aware of. What is the thickness of dura mater and how is it formed? What does the term dura mater mean? It's an outer layer. Answer? Of outer layer. The dura means outer. That means outer mater means layer. Is that the answer? The name dura mater derived from Latin for tough mother. Mater means mother in Latin. Okay, a tough dural, dural durability. Dura chrome. We used to have a footwear company called Dura Chrome. So dura means tough. Mater means mother. It's a hard mother. That is the meaning of that word dura mater. It has a thickness of 400 microns. Formed by randomly distributed fibers around the concentric layers. As dural lamina. Now coming to the next layer, what is the meaning of arachnoid mater? Where do they get attached? What is the meaning of arachnoid? A? Spider, sir. Spider web. Spider, excellent. That is arachnoid A means the Greek word for spider. And the oid means spider like or image of spider. Mater again is the mother because of the fine spider web like appearance of the delicate fibers of the arachnoid mater won't get attached to the subarachnoid space in the pia mater. So, this is why if these uh, projections are very strong, sometimes you know the inadequate spread of the local anesthetic which is injected into the subarachnoid space is because of this. So, you get a partial action you don't get a complete blockade that can be because of the uh, delicate fibers that go in some patients uh, congenitally they may be very thick for making it into compartments so the uh, spread of the local anesthetic may not be uniform in some cases that is the explanation given for patchy analgesia after the spinal and what is the meaning of fire matter now by this about to make Wordings, you know, mater means mother. So, dura mater is hard mother. Arachnoid mater is spider like mother. What is pia mater? Take a guess at least. Soft. Ah, yeah, it's a tender mother. So, pia mater means is tender mother. Okay, very kind and tender mother. What is the alternate term for proposed PDPH? I asked Abhirami in between. The answer is meningeal puncture headache. Okay, it is called a meningeal puncture headache. It is considered as an alternate treatment. So that is just out of to make uh, <coughs> boredom from less. So I thought I will include all those things. Okay, right. <coughs> 